Peter, in writing to people of his day, to Christians, in 2 Peter 1 and verse 4, in the latter part of that verse, makes it very clear that corruption is throughout the world by the lust of men being gratified. John, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, makes it very clear the whole world lieth in wickedness under the power of the wicked one. It's in this world that Satan exercises his power. And his power is designed to do one thing, get as many people to transgress God's, li uh, transgress God's will and die in that way so hell will be their eternal destiny. We sometimes think that today is considerably different from then, but it's really not. Today a host of people are clamoring for change. Now let's look at the word change for a moment. I like to see people change if they are in sin, caring not for God, if they're ignorant of the Bible and they don't know the gospel of Christ. Further, I like to see them learn the truth and personally respond to it from the heart. That's called conversion when they fully are obedient to the truth. <clears throat> Thus, that kind of change we wish could be for everybody. And wherever the pure, unadulterated word of God, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, has been sown and men take it into good and honest hearts, Luke 8, 15, and when they comply with the teachings of it, they are going to change and change for the better. They will be citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and that's all. And wherever the seed of the kingdom is sown by the teaching of the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1.16, and men are persuaded thereby, then they're going to change. But today's world, as I speak of people clamoring of change, are changing to all sorts of things that would be contrary to the teaching of the Bible. And they're going from bad to worse to much worse. The irrationality of postmodernism attempts to destroy all boundaries between right and wrong and truth and error. And that's where you get the idea that, well, that's your truth, but this is my truth. And who knows what anybody else's truth is? So it makes truth subjective and relative. And nobody can say, here is God's standard, objective and absolute. And it applies to all people across the board who are accountable to him for their actions. No, they have kicked against that, and they try to sell it. I say it's irrational, it's illogical, because they want you to know absolutely and objectively what their doctrine is, and yet their doctrine says nothing is absolute and objective. So they contradict themselves, but that's the world in which we live. Plenty of people believe that, and they don't see the contradiction for whatever reason. So-called modernity has quickly worked to secularize the society in which we live, and it seeks and does crush, in many cases, all social norms or traditions, especially anybody saying this is right and this is wrong. They simply do not like a static standard that points out what's right and things contrary to it are wrong. This has been going on for many years, but I think the thing that surprises some of us who've been on this earth for a good while is the rapidity with which it has transformed our world. It's, it's astounding. Now, there's a few in this room we can, who were up and going in the 1960s in that so-called revolution of society. And you think of the hippies and yippies and all that kind of thing that said get rid of the establishment and get rid of this and get rid of that. And especially when it came to sexual standards and use of dope and all that kind of thing. 
Well, that was the beginning of it, at least as far as it being publicly known by a lot of folks, although there had been people doing that kind of thing for a long time. But it has, in 50 years, done a tremendous amount of changing. I think faster than most of us realize. Philosophies, conduct, ideologies that only a few years ago were thought to be believed and advocated by only a few have jarred the country and thus the individuals that make it up to the core as the change in these areas have blitzkrieged, if you know what that means, throughout the Western world, and especially in America. But we're to the point now to ask, what is next on the horizon? I have no doubt that Satan is behind this destruction of biblical morals and religion. That's his business. He lives to do that. Nothing ever occupies his mind but that. And he wants all of us to stay away from the Word of God, to not study it, to not pray. He would like for those in the Lord's church to forget about the blueprint that is the New Testament, the inspired, infallible pattern, the seed of the kingdom, which is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He would dearly love for us to say, well, I don't, that's just tradition with us. We can change and some have. And so you see traditional services and you see modern services and all of that kind of thing. People don't read their Bible and more than that, they don't study it and they don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And thus they're held captive by he who is the greatest of capturers and that is Satan. He always seeks to undermine the truth. His whole uh, modus operandi is to get us to deceive ourselves by telling lies and get us in the process to think there really is no such thing as a lie. It's just your truth and thereby cause us ultimately and finally to be lost forevermore in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the eternal second separation from God of which no man returns. Well, regardless of how much worse it gets, if you know your Bible and believe it to be from God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, James 1, 25, if you believe Jesus as it's recorded in John 12, verse 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. If those things are true to you, then you have security and you have strength that can get you over about anything. It did the early church in the first century for they lived in the midst of all kinds of corruption. As we notice from 2 Peter 1, 4, the corruption that is in the world through lust. And as John wrote, the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. That hasn't changed. And yet the armor of God hasn't changed. Well, then why is it that the Lord's church is troubled so much, losing members, and uh, so many going away from the static standard of absolute spiritual truth that is the word of the New Testament? The problem is not with God or Christ or the Bible. The problem is with the people and their lack of faith in God based on the Bible. They just simply don't believe what the Bible says. You'll remember the writer of Hebrews warned those people back so long ago that uh, the people in the wilderness received the word of God but didn't profit them because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. You can read and understand the meaning of the words, but what meaning and purpose does it give to your life? Is it something you've just heard all your life and that's what people have done and you're not persuaded it is the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final revelation of God to man that will judge all men everywhere at the last day? The Bible is full of good material to comfort and to assure the child of God, even in the midst of temptation and persecution. James wrote in James 1, 7, every good gift 
and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. And I like the latter part of this. With whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. When God says something that man must know and man must do in order to be saved from sin, God's not going to change on that. Since the New Testament was fully revealed, confirmed to be from heaven and not from men by the miracle signs and wonders, and there we have it. Galatians 1 makes it very clear that we're not to add to it or take away from it. That though we, Paul says, are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed, anathema, which means cut off from God. Now that's in the word of God that an inspired writer said to churches, if they teach another kind of gospel, they ought to be cut off from God. Well, that's about as serious as it can get. I know of nothing worse than to be cut off from God. So it's only evil to forsake truth, morality that comes from it, and the religion derived therefrom. We need to understand that it doesn't make any difference what comes out of any government or any higher school of higher education or from any part of society. If it is contrary to the truth of God in the Bible, reject it. Yeah, but that puts me at odds with so many people, even in my own family and all my neighbors. Rather be at odds with everybody on this earth than to be at odds with God. For our God is a consuming fire. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The only thing man can do is do to us is what he can do to this body and that's temporary always remember whether you're young or old, sick or healthy rich or poor, male or female whatever even this passes away and we would do well to remember that not just on the bad things that are going on with us whether it's health or whatever but all the good things as we would look at it in this life, in the flesh even this shall pass away. So I like the song that reads, Time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth unmoved can stand. And you see then what we should do. Build your hopes, your expectations. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. The truth doesn't change. The truth concerning right and wrong is static. Whether it's morality, or whether it's how to become a Christian, the church, its organization, work and worship, and its eternal home. Build your things, your hopes on things eternal. Why do you do that? By cultivating your mind with the truth of God, and there is no other way. James 1.25 makes it clear that if we continue in the perfect law of liberty and that we're doer of the work, then that man's blessed his deed. Not only will he be blessed here to have the peace and comfort of knowing he's on God's side, and that's all that matters, but also that he has an eternal home far beyond all the troubles that are here. You know, one of the things that disturbs me that I would like to look at just for a moment. Heard it this past week when I was watching the news. Didn't wasn't necessarily looking for it, but it popped up and when it caught my attention. I I listened to it for a moment. There was a poll done back in May uh, May nineteenth through twenty twenty three this year, and the margin of error was plus or minus 3.53. It was conducted by the University of Chicago Institute of Politics by a couple of fellows who are pollsters. And one of the things that is so shocking that I think is a, a measure of the situation in this country 
three in ten Americans believe it may soon be necessary to take up arms against government. Three in ten Americans. Now, it, it wasn't just with one certain political view. It was across the board out of a thousand people that they interviewed. That says far more than just what it says in black and white. It tells me that people in general, which I think in general I knew that, but here the polls actually showing it. It tells me that people are disgruntled at about everything. Just look, look around about you. People are dissatisfied. If you get into a discussion or a conversation with somebody about anything, then you may hear some good things, but before it's over with, they are not happy campers. Well, you say, well, this needs to change in Washington and this needs to change in Austin and this needs to change in Houston or whatever. Well, there will always be such things that need to change. But that's not really what needs to change. And remember, we started off on this business of people clamoring for change. And we explained there's a good change and there's a bad change. What we need to realize, people don't know that they have left God. And they've left Jesus and they've left the word of God when it comes to how they make up their minds about anything and what they do. A prime example we already know. What is the status of marriage in the home? Well, so many people don't even believe in marriage anymore. Fornication, adultery are rampant among those who do and don't. And then you get into the whole mess of transgender and homosexuality. Nobody can believe this book to be the infallible word of the living God that will judge us on the last day and say all of those things are perfectly accepted. We've just gone through a month called Pride Month. Pride go up before fall. The very fact that people can be proud of immoral actions and perverted conduct, and it was called perverted. That's a word ruled out of our vocabulary nowadays. When was the last time you heard anybody talk about something being perverted? Unless they want to apply it to people who believe in God and Christ and the Bible. But that's what's going on. And we are expected as God's children to live righteous and even strive to reach many of these people, as many as we can, with the gospel of Christ. But it's going to take some boldness on our part. It's going to take a considerable amount of courage. But the Lord expects that out of us. If anybody should have righteous courage and boldness, it ought to be the faithful servants of God and the army of the Lord. When you read Ephesians 6, and the armor we're to put on, we are the army of the Lord. And the army has something to fight. And the whole world life in wickedness. And there's corruption in the world through lust. Now what are we to do? Just shrink up and go along with them. That's why so many brethren are falling away. They run after that stuff. They're caught up in the flesh. If we build our hopes on the modern culture, we will suffer disappointment here and, of course, eternal disappointment when we enter eternity. If we're going to have the right mindset toward one another, it'll be because we study the Bible and we do what the Bible says in our dealings one with another. Love your neighbors yourself. That will take care of so many things. If we love the brethren, we're interested in seeing every one of our brothers and sisters obedient to the gospel, living faithful. So we do what the Bible says to get that done. One thing that has not changed is man's proneness to change. You ever notice that? The culture of the ancient Greeks and Romans in many ways is comparable to our culture today. Although their languages, transportation, technology were different. Behaviorally and philosophically, there's not much difference. Because they're all human beings, moved by the same passions that we are. The things that Paul confronted on his preaching tours are, in many cases, 
the same things in one form or another that we find in the world today. So almost 2,000 long years ago, Paul, by inspiration, preached to the people of Athens. And the inspired Luke, in recording it in Acts 17, 21, said that they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. You can see how that works because watch how entertainment just bounces all over the place to give those people some new thing. Look at the games that are presented on the computers. Look at all that stuff. Well, they're tired of this one. they got to go to something else. They're tired of this one. They go to something else. Even if it has the same old spin to it, they give it a different pair of clothes or something or another, but it's the same old thing. That's pretty much like folks are then at all times. Everything's relative and change is to be desired. Well, in most things. But anything rooted in tradition or considered absolute is to be shunned and ridiculed, especially God and the Bible. You'll find the world around us is as hypocritical as it can be. Those in the power, or think they have it, want to make people do things and give them no hearing. They think that's all right. Well, this nation wasn't even built on that kind of idea. But while the world restlessly drifts, or rushes, or however you want to describe it, from one philosophy to the next, there are some things that will never change. We can build our hopes on things eternal and anchor our souls to the rock of ages. First of all, God in his essence and therefore his nature and the attributes flowing therefrom is unchanging. Malachi 3, 6 makes that clear in the Old Testament. And when you come over to Hebrews 13, verse 8, same thing's made. Now, we didn't say that God in the unfolding of how he would save man from his sins down through time didn't change. Actually, in the mind of the eternal God, there's no changing. It's just the change comes from patriarchal to mosaical to the New Testament because he's having to deal with man who is locked in time and space and thus from eternity he gradually gives those things as man grows and develops to understand them until in the fullness of time. God sent forth his son, Galatians 4 and verse 4. And since the New Testament has been delivered, there's been nothing else as to what's right or wrong. We must never reduce God to our own likeness, and that's what most people do. God inhabits eternity. And he transcends space and time and material things. Those are created matters. One time they didn't exist. And there in eternity he spoke them into existence. In our thinking, we dare not attempt then to make God over into something that's like us. In departing from God, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that the Gentiles did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Tell me the difference in them and today. A host of people do not want to retain God in their knowledge. They suppose the truth was just whatever they wanted it to be. And as far as the truth of God, they suppressed that truth because they didn't want to live the kind of lives that God expected them to live. You don't have to become an atheist or die the deity of Christ of the inspiration of the scriptures to apostatize if you uh, have been a member of the church. That's the only way you could apostatize. You can just simply get tired of, I just don't believe he means that. Well, what does it say? Well, it says this, but I don't really think he's going to hold us to it. And that happens so much in the area of marriage, divorce, remarriage, and so many other things. How about just lying? Long, long time people have said black lies, white lies. White lies are all right. Black lies, no. Uh, biggies. So we have long had the seed sown in our minds that we can get by with some things, even though we know the Bible condemns it, or we can leave undone what God said we ought to be doing. Man is fickle. That means I've got to come to that conclusion about myself. What's going to keep me from hurting myself? Think about that. Think about kids that are two years old. You should let them get out there and run around and never do anything to 
watch over them or to guide them or to... Well, what are they going to end up doing? Eventually, they're going to hurt themselves. Well, we are the same way. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We need direction from God who made us. So we readily change on a lot of things. The Bible's full of that account and history's full of it too. But there are some things you don't change. And the will of heaven is one of them. Humans have typically pursued pleasure. And what they like to do is glorify themselves. You ever notice how many things there are in every field of endeavor, in every level of society to where you can promote yourself or you can be promoted? No, promotion is not bad. But just think how everybody strives to say, look at me. Look what I did. How great I am. It simply focuses in on the time, space, and human things. As Brother Keeble said long years ago about a Texan's vast spread in his ranch when he was asked, what do you think about that? He said, the Lord's going to burn it all up. Now, that's the way we need to look at this world and this life. The Lord's going to burn it all up. So what's he telling us to do? Hold to God's unchanging hand. But humankind has created a God that allows them to do as they please and live like they want to live without guilt or iniquity. So we see people die who live as rotten a lives as possible when you lay them alongside what the Bible says one ought to do. And then if anything's said about where they are, well, they're in heaven looking at me. They're comforted. People say anything. And denominational preachers have long got in the pulpit and in a sermon, a funeral sermon, tried to make some old reprobate look like he was the Apostle Paul. I don't know what they think they're getting out of that. That person is not even there. So who are they speaking that to? The people that want the ears tickled, and they'll pat him on the back. The religious world has helped lead the change, and it has not been turning closer to God. All kinds of human doctrines are there. Denominationalism stands against everybody being united as Jesus prayed. No longer do we present God as a God who hates and punishes sin and demands repentance on your part and mine. Instead, he's basically categorized and characterized as a doting heavenly grandfather who's in some stages Alzheimer's or some dementia. And he lets us get by with about any mischief we want to. Or maybe he's like a, somebody's personal slave who's there to do whatsoever we need him to do when we ask him to or tell him to, people do not see God as the God that's a consuming fire. They do not see him as bringing every work into judgment, as having that kind of control. I often wonder when you see popes and presidents and all those people, you think of them the moment they step into eternity. What in the world do they face? What kind of a shock? Is it? Well, I don't want to experience it, and I don't want anybody else to, and I don't know any way to do it but to preach the gospel and urge you to believe in God and Christ and the Bible and do what God said do and the way God said do it and for the reason or sometimes more than one reason God said do it. And never quit. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ, Ephesians 1, verse 3. And one must believe in Christ, repent of his sins, confess one's faith in Christ, and be buried with his Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. That's how it works. More than that, he will not require of you to become a Christian. Less than that, you cannot become a Christian. And you'll remain lost and tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and slight of man, whereby they lay in cunning craftiness to deceive. And that's the world. The Bible is God's word. And that word does not change. And if there's anything going to help us face whatever we face today or whatever may come tomorrow, it is God's infallible, glorious word. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever.
That can't be said of anything else that's hanging around here today. But if you hold to the truth, you learn the truth and from the heart, obey the truth, and you live your life in the light of it, no matter what people do or don't do, you will enjoy eternal life in heaven someday. If we want to see the church remain the Lord's church and all that that implies, then we will hold that word, that divine pattern that is the New Testament of Christ, and we won't be moved off from it, regardless of what people say. This is the way it is. And we must be the way the Bible says that we should be if we're to get through it. If you don't want to, there's everything in the world to turn to. But there's just one way to the pearly gates, to the crown of life, to those who wait. It is the old crossroad. And the way called straight is just one way to the pearly gates. If you're subject to the gospel call this morning, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.